Hi. I'm going to start. Welcome to our evening service. Now, welcome to those online, if you're watching. I always wonder if anyone's really watching. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if, you, if there's anybody out there, say something. Make, make, write a comment. Say, yes, I'm watching. I always sit there going, no, <laughs> I'm watching anyway. We'll see. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to just open with a word of prayer, and then we'll invite the worship team. I, just like, I think starting off with worship is a great way to begin. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are real, you're alive, you are our God, you are our Father. I pray that this evening you speak to our hearts. God, that you reach past our doubts, our fears, our thoughts, our emotions, and uh, speak to our hearts, speak to our soul. Uh, Lord, we dedicate this evening to you. Uh, we pray your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so during the first song, let's um, collect the offering. And do we have somebody to collect the offering? Oh, our offering collector. Hello, everybody. As Rao said, we're going to start with some worship. So we're starting with the song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, which is a good way to start asking God to open our spiritual eyes and to see him for who he really is. So feel free to stand if you want to stand, and we'll begin. <laughs> Ivan just lost his pick. We're good. We can go. <laughs> He found it. <laughs> All right.
is a place where we find peace like no other, Lord. We find joy and we find freedom. And Lord, we can come to you and know that we are safe and we're in the capable hands of the Lord God Almighty, who's above everything, Lord. And I pray that we would crave to draw near to you more and more, Lord, that we wouldn't get so lost in the busyness of our lives, Lord, that we would not forget to stop and draw into your presence and to feel the joy and the peace that comes with just surrendering everything to you, Lord, and remembering that all things are made by you, all things are for you, Lord, and Lord, we are living for you. I pray that you would help us to live with eternity in our hearts, looking forward to, Lord, the future that we have with you. I pray that you would fill us with your spirit tonight, Lord. I pray that you'd make us hungry for your spirit if we aren't already, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Thanks, guys. Um, before the big guns come out, um, it's tradition here that the person leading the meeting gives a little mini sermon. So I'm going to fire my air rifle um, and hope that God speaks through these few words to you. And I've been thinking about this theme that everyone is speaking about this month, the theme of salvation. And I was thinking about the fact that we all get tired. Uh, that was me. <laughs> oh, I could hear myself. I could hear an echo. <laughs> um, you know, we all get tired. And looking at the people gathered here today, some of you might be feeling a bit tired as well. And maybe those mystery people sitting in their living rooms. You know, it's normal to get tired, and God created a wonderful fix for being tired. It's called rest. Sometimes there's a tiredness, I've realized. There's a weariness um, that kind of seeps into the marrow of our bones. It just kind of fills us, and we just... We're weary, we're tired, and a good night's sleep doesn't fix it. Not even a good 10-hour sleep. I have no idea what that feels like anymore. I, I remember, I remember the days, but when you get to my advanced years, it's, you sleep in bits and pieces. Um, but even then, the tiredness doesn't go away. And this is a little bit of, uh, this is a little bit autobiographical as well. Um, over the past years, I've felt a bit of this. You know, we get tired of the same old over and over and over again. We get tired of routine. We get tired of surprises. We get tired of holidays. We get tired of work. We get tired of play. And sometimes we just get tired of being tired. Um, and it's like, eh. <laughs> you know, that, that great expression, eh. Um, and that's what we feel like. Uh, it's just whatever, you know. When the words whatever come to our mind, then something is wrong. Um, and rather than turning to a TV evangelist or the latest self-help book, um, I thought I'd turn to some age-old wisdom to go back, go way back to 400 AD, actually, and to an ancient father of the church, St. Augustine. He's also called um, the Bishop of Hippo or Augustine of Hippo. That's a place, not an animal. Uh, this man had experienced both the deception of pleasure and sin and also the amazing grace of God in his life. He's a man who knew God. Um, and he wrote a lot. He was a prolific writer and, um, and a speaker and a debater and an orator. And we're blessed to have his writings and I want to read just two short excerpts from the Confessions of St. Augustine. He says this. This is a modern English translation. Great are you, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is your power and infinite is your wisdom. And man desires to praise you, for he is part of your creation. He bears his mortality about him and carries the evidence of his sin and the proof that you do not resist, sorry, that you do resist the proud. Still he desires to praise you. This man who is only a small part of your creation, you have prompted him that he should delight to praise you for you have made us for yourself. And our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. And that, that one line is quoted a lot, that our hearts are restless and tired, and they will continue to be restless and tired, regardless of what counselor you go to see, regardless of what book you read, regardless of what help you get, our hearts will remain restless and tired and weary until we find our rest in God. He goes on to say this, who 
shall bring me to rest in you. Who will send you into my heart so to overwhelm it that my sins be blotted out and I may embrace you, my only good? Say to my soul, I am your salvation. So speak that I may hear. Behold, the ears of my heart are before you, O Lord. Open them. And say to my soul, I am your salvation. Salvation is more than a ticket to heaven. Salvation is being saved from everything, being saved from our worry, from our stress, from our tiredness. And God's promise is that we will find rest in him. If you're tired today, listen. The Bible says, as deep calls to deep. So I believe the heart of God is calling to your heart this evening. And he's saying these words, I, I am your salvation. I made you for myself. Find your rest in me. Rest from your striving, rest from your doubts, rest from your fears and from your worry. Just rest. I pray that this will be our prayer, that God, you, you tonight, you are my salvation. You are my salvation. Everything Everything that I have, every worry, every rest, every, sorry, every doubt, every fear, every sin is cast away when I am found in you because you are my salvation. You saved us. You saved me from myself to yourself. And I pray that God grants you rest in him today. And as we listen to uh, the words that God has put on Logan's heart about salvation, that, that we, w- we would take it and we would meditate on it, hide it in our hearts, and, um, and pray that God would speak to us, speak to our souls tonight. I want to pray for Logan as he comes up. Do you want to come up, mate, and I'll just pray for you before you speak. Father, I I thank you uh, for Logan. I thank you for the word that you have put on his heart. Lord, I pray that this evening you would speak to him, that you speak through him and speak to us. We dedicate his words and his message to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Can we hear me? Yep, loud enough? Cool. Let's get rid of that. Wonderful. All right. Hello, church. How are we? Come on, a little bit more. Hello. Yeah, better. Cool. Hello, everyone online. I know everyone here, but uh, for those of you online, if you don't know me or you're watching this later down the track, my name's Logan. I'm part of the English team here, and my wonderful wife, Sarah, and I have been running the young adults for the last couple of months. It's been great. Um... And I will be sharing the word with you tonight. So get excited. You'll have to excuse me. I'm going to have to look a little bit bit closer at my notes tonight. I have been up since 5 a.m. and my eyes are tired. Um, Okay, let's just make sure I've got all of my devices on. (laughs) You need about 10 of them these days. All right. Cool. Still hear me? All right, let's, uh, let's open in prayer. Father God, I just want to pray tonight that uh, the words that I speak would not be my own. Father, I, I pray that you would touch the hearts of everyone here tonight by what is said through your word. Lord, I pray that as we talk about salvation, that you would just open up new revelations to everyone here and everyone listening to this message. Lord, I pray that you would touch their hearts and 
give them a new realization for the, the incredible work that you did on the cross, Lord, and that uh, that tonight would just just open their eyes to the life-changing nature of the salvation that we've been given. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, um, so I'm going to start off with a quick testimony. We've, um, we've kind of been doing that this month as part of this series of salvation. Um, so I'm going to talk about my salvation and kind of how that happened in my life. Um, up the back there, if you're here, you'll see my father uh, and my mother. They have both been very heavily involved in ministry uh, since I was very young. Um, in fact, my dad was a pastor for a good portion of me growing up and then a chaplain. So, uh, And my mum as well, she's been uh, like heavily involved in ministry. So growing up for me, um, Christian influence was just all around me. I, I knew plenty about the Word of God and I knew plenty about um, what Jesus had done for me. But um, I think for me, my salvation wasn't uh, fully realized until maybe my mid to late teens. Um, I was baptized uh, in my early teens, and I'd, I'd said the Lord's Prayer, but it wasn't until later on that I, I fully realized the magnitude of what had happened in my life. Um, although I'd, you know, I, you say the Lord's Prayer when you're younger, and, and then I was baptized, as I said, in my early teens, it, it slowly began to dawn on me as I grew older, and, and the people around me were acting kind of differently. Um, and even when I tried to rebel as a teenager, it just sort of didn't work so well. Um, there was always that kind of nagging and, and um, conviction uh, as I grew up. And um, the Lord kind of was constantly tugging on my heart. And it wasn't until I was maybe 18, 19 that um, I really fully dedicated my life to God. I'd, I'd said the, the sinner's prayer plenty of times and I had been baptized at an early age, but it wasn't until later on when I, I really knelt down on my knees and said, God, I give it all to you. Um, no matter what, it, what I, I want, I don't, it's not mine anymore. I, you know, it's all yours now. You do with it what you please. Um, and ever since then, I mean, it's, it's obviously been a journey, um, but um, my salvation has just been, since then, um, my relationship with God and, and, and from that moment has, has just been growing and growing and growing. There's a sort of strange period for me in between saying a sinner's prayer, being baptized and then fully realizing it where I, I didn't fully know where I stood and what, what I, you know, my relationship was. But ever since that day of full commitment to God, I've, you know, it's, my relationship has just grown. Um, and for me, that's what it's looked like. It's a, bit, it's a bit different to, I think, what a lot of people get, um, especially if you've come from a non-Christian background. Um, a lot of non-Christians have a moment and then, um, and, or a build up to a, a moment of surrender. But for me, it was many, many, many moments of surrender. Um, and I think for different people, it can look different, but ultimately it ends up in one choice and one event. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So, on to Salvation. I'll do a quick recap on what we talked a little bit about last week. Um, last week was very much Old Testament. We, we talked about why we need salvation and the, the kind of broken nature that we inherited as, as men um, from birth. Uh, we kind of got um, a bit of a picture of the bad news uh, for, for those of us who, who aren't saved. Um, the fact is that we inherited a bit of a stuff up. We've, we'd separated ourselves from God and um, the way that we are, the way that we were living prior to salvation is, uh, is in sin. And that's, and that's the way we're born. That's the inheritance we're given as, as humans. Um, so that's the bad news. Um, there's, a, there's a clear salvation, a clear need for salvation in our lives. Um, and, Although I'm not going to necessarily be talking about this aspect of salvation, I really wanted to hit on it first. Um, see, as I was saying, we're born into sin, and before salvation, we were basically, well, an analogy I've heard is, we're like people who are on death row and don't even know it. We're like prisoners in cells 
who think that it's normal. Until a man, a son of a king, comes along, and not only does he explain the mess that we're in, but and the charges that have been laid against us, and the penalty that awaits us, he then unlocks the cell, opens it up, lets us out, and takes our place. This is, and always will be, the greatest part of the word salvation to us. We're free. From the moment you are saved, you are no longer a dead man walking. Not only are you alive, and not only will for the rest of your life here on earth you be alive in Christ, but now you will live forever with him. I really wanted to hit on that first, because tonight I'm going to be talking about some other aspects that aren't talked about as frequently, but that, that is the most important thing I want you to take away from tonight, especially if you're, a, if you're someone who isn't saved. You need to know that. If you're not saved, you're still in the danger zone. So, what we're going to talk about now We're going to go into something a little more specific. We are going to define the line between salvation and sanctification. So, show of hands in the room, who's heard of sanctification? Cool, I'm liking seeing a lot of hands. (laughs) I was hoping so. Um, So, uh, there is a big difference between salvation and sanctification. Put plainly, salvation is an event and sanctification is a process. Salvation is a gift. It comes with the entry of the Holy Spirit into your life, and it's the start of a new life with God. We can see this in Ephesians 2, 8-9, where it says, God saved you by His grace when you believe. Um, And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that you have done, so none of us can boast about it can also be seen in Acts 2.38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, as I mentioned before, I I said a sinner's prayer, and then I was baptized. Um, There's a reason I mentioned both of those things when talking about salvation. Uh, In John 3, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of spirit. That's why when we have a new Christian profess profess their faith and give their life to God, we we give great gravity to baptism. Um, And although we've got a lot of Christians here tonight that were baptized long ago, it's still very important to talk about um, because it is a big part of of our faith. Stepping into the water and making that declaration before, before people that you are now giving your life to Christ. It, it's, it's a powerful metaphor, but it's also a big stepping stone in our faith. Um, so let's talk a little bit about sanctification. Um, in 1 Peter 4.5, it says, And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay, and through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive His salvation, which is to be revealed on the last day for all to see. And in Philippians 1.6, and I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue His work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. See, sanctification is a journey. It's a journey that us who live now in the here and now but not yet, um, which I'll explain a little bit later, it's a journey that we have to undertake as we wait for Jesus to return. Sanctification is everything between your salvation and you coming face to face with God, whether that's through the return of Jesus Christ and a rapture or through death of your earthly body. 
So, we're going to be focusing on salvation tonight. What does this gift mean for us? Well, as I said before, it's the start of a journey towards coming face to face with God um, and becoming the resurrected, recreated, purified version of yourself that He's paved the way for you to become. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, when we look at salvation in the wider picture of our lives as Christians, when we look back and we look at other people's lives, salvation is a cataclysmic event in the wider picture of your life. Um, It may not come with flashing lights or a big boom, but it does some serious damage. In fact, to your old self, to the self before salvation, salvation is lethal. Um, In this event, your old self's passions and desires die. What you once were before Christ dies. We can see this in Galatians 5.2, where it says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified, have, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I think that this is, um, I think that this is maybe something that isn't spoken about enough necessarily. We speak a lot of new life in the church. It's important, and we'll get to that. But I think we need to talk about the death of your old self a little bit first. I think that um, for a lot of us, we cling to our identity uh, that we had before we were a Christian a little bit too much. Um, And myself, I'm guilty of this. I think that uh, we don't realize that what we had before, what we were before, it is gone on the inside. And it's replaced with Christ. Um, A great analogy I heard, I was listening to a pastor, Levi Lusco. He gave the analogy of nationality. When you introduce yourself to someone from just about birth, you introduce yourself with your name and your nationality. I'm Logan from Australia. That's Howard from Australia. We've got Yoni from Finland. You see, from a very young age, we're given a name, a nationality, a family, um, a home country, and what's their job. And these are, these are the things we build up our identity on. But although they are still tied to our flesh, and although we start to live in a world where we have to write our name on paper, our nationality in the form at the line, at the main roads, that's not where our identity lives anymore as Christians. See, what you've been given is much greater than in Australia, or than a Finland, or than a bike mechanic or a Sanders, or a Hirvanen, or whatever. Whatever you previously identified yourself as, know this, you are now a Christian. If you have let Christ into your life, if you have been saved, you are now above all those things. You are a Christian. You are a son of God. You see, with this, with this rebirth, with this new life, comes a new identity, it becomes a new future. You're given new priorities and a new home country. We're now aliens where we live. We may be physically living in Australia, but our home country is no longer Australia. Our home country is no longer Finland. Our home country is no longer wherever you grew up. Our home country is heaven. Our home country is new earth where God will make everything new and pure again. In Ephesians 2, 1-6, it says, As for you, 
You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been, you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in his heavenly realms, in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, rather. So we have a destiny now. We have a future. Our future isn't here. Our future is there. We're now citizens of the throne room of God. I am Logan Christian, son of God. You are sons and daughters. So, oh, no. <laughs> so, um, we are now saved and understand our identity is in Christ, and that our priority is Christ and His priorities. So what does a Christian life look like? Are we now pure and complete beings that are sinless? No, no. You see, uh, again, this is, this is probably the part that non-Christians find, or people who haven't come to Christ yet find the most confusing, is when they see Christians still sinning. They see us still making mistakes. They, we speak of holy purity, but we don't come down glowing from the mountains as if we'd just seen the face of God. You see, that, um, that now and not yet part of our life, that's where this comes into play. You see, we're living in a, in a space of God's story where Jesus has come and He has saved us from eternal damnation. He's saved us from paying for our sins and He has given the Holy Spirit to replace what was once dead in us. But our flesh is still living in a sinful world and we still have to wrestle the flesh. See, we are not made up of our flesh. Our decisions are not of our flesh. That tugging in your heart, when it pulls you away from sin, when you think, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I shouldn't be doing this. Oh, God, I, I feel like I, sh- I should be going this way, doing this thing. That's not our flesh. It is the Holy Spirit in you. That leading is the Holy Spirit in you. So we live in this sort of weird tension of like we're saved and we're, and we're made pure in Christ, but still got to work for it. And my flesh is still kind of tugging this way and the Holy Spirit's tugging me this way. That's why um, I've said it before, there is nothing and no one less joyful than a disobedient Christian. So we can never be fully happy once we're saved in sin. We can't enjoy it. And we can never be fully with God when we're sinning, if we're disobedient. So it's this weird dichotomy. That's why God calls us towards sanctification. Although I would love to go into that. I believe Yoni is going to be touching on it next week, so I won't go too too deep in, into that. Um, see, this isn't, isn't a forever situation, though. Um, this here now, but not yet, um, it's only for now. See, when we're called home, Christ has a new body waiting for us a pure body. The work that He's doing within us will be on the outside. It will show. But not yet. That's what we're waiting for. Um, Cool. So, I just wanted to go over a few key points here.
as I was saying, Christ has saved you from certain death as a Christian. We were given a birthright of, of death and hopelessness. And that's not our fault, but um, it's what we were given. But as I said, Christ came in and he saved us from that. He took that burden from us. But although salvation is a one-time thing, it's, a, it's an event. It is a life-changing, direction-changing event in your life. It's not the end of the road. It's just the beginning. And that's, that's where sanctification comes in. It's that working your body and your flesh towards that picture that now lives within you, towards that, that molding that God is doing in your life. Once again, we are no longer our old selves. And the further we get from that identity and the closer we get to Christ's identity, the happier, the more peaceful that we will be. You see, we're not called to be our old selves. And that's why sometimes we feel uncomfortable with, um, with you know, obeying our flesh, I guess. It's when, when that tugging comes from the Holy Spirit and we walk the other way, it's why it's so uncomfortable. See, we're not meant for that anymore. We're meant to be Christians above all, followers of Christ above all. Um, okay. So, in our day-to-days, we must remember that we are waiting, but not stagnant. We're not waiting in the sense that we're sitting in a waiting room doing nothing, looking at the clock. I might read a bit of my Bible. Just read it though. I'm not going to do anything. See, God has a bigger plan for, for us. We're meant to be His hands and feet in this world. You see, we may be in this waiting room waiting for heaven, but there's plenty of other people around us who aren't in that same room, aren't in that same situation. And the gravity of where you were should draw you to the people who are still there. If we remember and look back at where we were and what we, what we were doomed for, sometimes we need to be Jesus in that sense and step into other people's lives, peek through the cell and say, hey, something's coming and it's not good. And I know this guy right here and he's got an amazing offer. I think you should hear him out. So, going into this week, I want us to remember that ultimately our identity is in Christ. And although it may feel tiring, we may get weary, we can rest in the fact that our home and our future and our priorities are now in Him. No matter what happens here, Jesus Christ is our priority. Jesus Christ is our home. We have a seat next to Him. We can have peace in the fact that we're saved, no matter what happens here. So go for gold. Be His hands and feet. Whisper in as many cells as you can. Pull as many people out as you can because He is coming back. And He will make you whole. And when we stand face to face with Him, we want to hear those wonderful words, well done, my good and faithful servant. You see, that perspective, that eternal perspective, that's what keeps us going. When we, when we stop looking up and we stop looking ahead at that goal off in the distance, we just get drudged down and that's where we get weary. So, this week and in the weeks to come, I want you to run the race. We'll all do it together.
Amen? Amen. Sorry, it's a shorter one tonight, guys. Oh, you already turned my PowerPoint off. That's better. Ivan's taking notes. <laughs> um, look, I hope you all have a lovely week. And I want to say thank you to Raoul as well for what he shared tonight. I think that uh, it's, it's true. We, we do need to be resting in God. All right, I'm just going to close in prayer. If you all close your eyes. Lord, I just ask that tonight you would be helping us to work out our salvation. I pray that you would change our perspective. Lord, I pray that you would remove our eyes from the problems of our own lives and move them towards your priorities. God, I pray that you would help us to reach out into as many of those locked cells as possible, Father. Lord, I pray that we would share the good news that you have already won the battle. Lord, I pray that we would, as we listen to sanctification next week from Yoni, Lord, I pray that we would really take it in. Lord, that we would appreciate the event of salvation in our lives. And Lord, I pray that that appreciation would create momentum towards sanctification. I pray that it would create drive in us, Father, to move closer towards the Jesus-shaped image of us that you see. I want to thank you, Father, for every single person here tonight. I want to ask that you would bless them into this week and that they would find peace with you and rest with you and peace in the fact that they know where they're going. They know where their home country is. Father, I pray their identity would be found in you as a church and as individuals. Thank you, God, in your name. Amen. The iPad shuffle. Okay, thank you, Logan. Um, really appreciate your message. Yeah, good one. Work out not for your salvation. Uh, I guess we're going to turn off the... It's Anyway, Easter. Easter services. There's going to be um, a 6 p.m. Good Friday evening service. And you can see there Sarah and Jan and Maria are going to be... Who's preaching? Oh, I didn't know whether it's them leading and Sarah preaching or the other way around. Okay. Um, 10 a.m. Um, on that Saturday morning, right? Saturday morning, different from what you have on the mm, Saturday morning, Yorma is going to lead and Vesa preach? Yes. Okay, yes, English communion service and 6 p.m. Logan is speaking. Um, testimonies and, oh, Logan is leading. We have testimonies and okay. Sami um, also uh, preaching. So... Easter services, there are three English ones. 6 p.m. Friday, 10 a.m. Saturday, and 6 p.m. on Sunday. Now, are there any prayer points?